before we do that, uh, we will take refuge and take the precepts. So everyone say with me. Sadhu, 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 Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arhato, Sama Sambuddhasa, Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arhato, Sama Sambuddhasa, Namo tasse bhagavato arhato samma sambuddhasse buddhang sarenang gachami dhammang sarenang gachami sanghang sarenang gachami Dutiyampi buddhang sarenang gachami. Dutiyampi dhammang sarenang gachami. Dutiyampi sanghang sarenang gachami. Tatiyampi buddhang sarenang gachami. Tatiyampi dhammang sarenang gachami. Tatiyampi sanghang sarenang gachami. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. To observe the five precepts, say after me. I observe the precept of I observe the precept of abstaining from killing beings. Abstaining from killing beings. I observe the precept of. I observe the precept of abstaining from stealing. Abstaining from stealing. I observe the precept of. I observe the precept of abstaining from sexual misconduct. Abstaining from sexual misconduct. I observe the precept of. I observe the precept of. Abstaining from telling lies. Abstaining from telling lies. I observe the precept of. I observe the precept of. Abstaining from taking. Abstaining from taking. Intoxicating drinks and drugs. Intoxicating drinks and drugs. I follow these precepts. I follow these precepts. For happiness in this life. For happiness in this life. For rebirth in heaven. For rebirth in heaven. And to realize the four noble truths. And to realize the four noble truths. In this Gautama Buddha's dispensation. In this Gautama Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Uh, so today we're going to be covering the last few parts of dependent origination. And then that will be it. it means we're finished covering it. Uh, so today we're going to be, we covered, so last, the, for the last few weeks, we covered up to, uh, covered up to the six sense basis. Let me see, covered up to Salayatana. Now from today, we're going to be talking about, uh, the ones at the top. We're going to be seeing why there's a reason, but the reason is that, um, but the reason is that, uh, the sense bases come and so forth. And we're going to see the whole complete process. We're going to try to finish all of that today. Uh, Dhammada, could you let me screen share? Yeah. Okay. Uh, can everyone see my screen? So we've covered quite a lot. I'm not gonna, can you guys see this? 
we covered all of this so far. We said that suffering, the reason for suffering is birth. Now I'm going to go through this very quickly. The reason for birth was that there was comma to be, there was comma to bear fruit. That means bhava. And the reason there was bhava was clinging. The reason there was clinging was craving. The reason for craving is craving is feeling. And the reason for feeling is contact. And then we can't, talked about this. This was the final thing we talked about, which was the reason for contact is the six sense bases. Then uh, the Bodhisattva, uh, when he was examining this, he was when he was looking at the reasons why these things occur, why beings are born, he saw that there was also a reason for the six sense bases to be there. And that was something called name and form. So name and form is two parts. Name and form is two things, but they're un you can't separate them. You can't split them. You can't ever say this is one part and this is the other part and say them separately in a sense that you can't split them in real life. So when we talk about form, uh, yeah, I'll move all of this. When we talk about form, let's talk about form first. We say that form is anything that is made up of the four great elements and the four great elements themselves. So again, when we say four great elements, uh, we're talking about the earth element, the water element, the fire element, and the air element. But this doesn't mean you're made of earth, water. Air. This means that there are parts in our body, the, every single thing actually, not just our body, but every single form is made up of things that will eventually uh, become part of the earth, will eventually become part of water, will eventually become part of the heat in the uh, atmosphere, will eventually become part of air. Those are the four elements. So form, again, is the four great elements themselves plus anything made up of the four great elements. And then he, this is the very interesting part. Name, the Supreme Buddha taught, is five things. So name is feeling, perception, intention, contact, and awareness. Now, last week, we talked about how uh, these feelings, perceptions, and intentions arise. And we say we said that they arise due to contact. You guys remember that? We said, uh, remember with this? We talked about this. We said when the eye and the form is there, then there's a chance of eye consciousness arising. But we said there's something missing here. We how if the eye and the con the form is there, it doesn't guarantee that eye consciousness will arise. So there was something there was a missing piece here, and that missing piece is awareness. Awareness or attention has to be there for these two things to come together and allow eye consciousness to arise. Now a good example is let's say you're watching a, let's say you're watching something. And then someone comes into the room and calls your name. But you're so focused on what you're watching that you don't hear that person. Your, your consciousness doesn't go from your eye to your ear. Does that make sense? So even though that person is calling you, there's a sound, there's the ear, but ear consciousness isn't arising. That person saying your name, but the consciousness is not arising in the ear. What's the reason? The reason is that the awareness, our awareness is not there. Then maybe that person says it louder. He says your name louder. And then you turn around and say, what do you need? So what happened? Awareness arose. So here, when the I and the form is there, there also needs to be awareness. With awareness, uh, the consciousness has the chance to arise in that specific uh, sense. So if it's the ear, ear consciousness has the chance to arise with the sound, uh, with the ear, and then awareness. So does everyone understand that? Uh, so we say this. So the Supreme Buddha said, he lists it like this, feeling, perception, intention, contact and awareness. So he lists the five like that. 
but we can clearly see that awareness needs to come before contact. That's why there's a little arrow here. The awareness is there because contact arises from awareness. Why? Because awareness has to be there in order for those two things. If it's I and their form, awareness has to be there for I consciousness to arise. Then the combination of the form, the I, and the I consciousness is called I contact. And then when I contact occurs, these three things happen. Feeling happens, perception happens, and intention happens. Does that make sense? So that's the order of these things. So when we say, what are the six senses made of? They are made of name and form. Your eye is made of these two things. Your ear is made of these two things. Your tongue, your nose, your body, your mind, they're all made up of name and form, which is these two things. Does that make sense? Everyone have everyone understand that? Then, so now we, when we talked about dependent origination, we said name and form is the reason the six sense bases are there. The reason the six with the six sense bases being there, then contact has the chance to occur. But the Supreme Buddha in another sutta, in another discourse, he explains how contact arises without mentioning the six sense bases. And we're going to learn that. It's very, very beautiful. It's very, very interesting. Now, uh, when we talk about contact, this is normally what we say when there's contact. So the eye, the form, and the eye consciousness is eye contact. The ear, sound, and the ear consciousness is ear contact. The nose, a smell, and nose consciousness is nose contact. The tongue, and then taste. When most people think this, they think of food, but this is taste. So medicine, medicine has a taste. Anything that has a taste, maybe in the even in the air, as you breathe, if you breathe in from your mouth, maybe a taste happens. Those are all tastes. So the tongue, a taste, and tongue consciousness is tongue contact. And then the body and a tangible. So even heat is something we feel when it's hot outside, we're feeling that. That's body contact occurring. So the body, a tangible and body consciousness is body contact. And then the mind, mental objects, that means like things we think about, plus mind consciousness is mind contact. And this is contact occurring from the six sense bases. That's how the Buddha explains it. But then the Buddha also explains another type of contact. And that's the contact that happens from name and form. So we discussed that form is these four elements, which is the earth element, water element, fire element, wind element. And every single form, no matter what we're talking about, it is made up of these things. And we said name is feeling, perception, intention, which arises due to contact. And contact arises due to awareness, okay? We, I just repeated everything. Now we know the two types of uh, the two things, right? Now the Supreme Buddha said there is something called special contact of form. And in a Pali, we say Rupakai Adivachana Sampas. Now this is something you need to be very, very, you need to think about this very, very. Uh, with a concentrated mind, like focus very well, listen attentively, because this is a bit confusing. Okay, Vishaka? So now look at this picture. What is it? This is a mouse, right? So we see this, this is a mouse. Now when you see this mouse, there is a, how do you know this is a mouse? In your mind, you think this is a mouse, right? Does anyone say this is a dog? Chaturma, is this a dog? No, this is a mouse. So what's the reason we know this is a mouse? We know it because there is a certain feeling, perception, intention involved with this, involved with this mouse. 
And that arose, those three things arose because of contact, which in turn arose because of awareness. Understand? So when we say mouse, in your head right now, there's a certain feeling associated with this. There's a certain intention. There's a certain uh, perception and intention associated with this because of contact and awareness. Make sense? So these things are there. These things are there because when we say mouse, these name, the name portion is occurring in our minds. Do you understand that? Does that make sense? Vishakha, you understand that? Okay, so there's a certain feeling, perception, and intention associated with this, this animal. Now we say mouse again. Now, how do you know this mouse and the other mouse are different in your mind, correct? We're not talking about the same mouse now? So this, when you immediately see this, a different feel, a different kind of feeling, a different kind of perception, a different kind of intention is being associated with this due to contact and awareness. So when we say, when we're talking about something, now, uh, what are these two things made of? These are both mice. These are both, we say mouse. But what are they made up of? What are these two things made of? They're made up of the four great elements, right? We said form is made up of the four great elements plus the four great elements of themselves. So a mouse is, this mouse is made up of the four great elements. This mouse is made up of the four great elements. I'm made up of the four great elements. You're all made up of the four great elements. But for each, uh, each certain set of four great elements, we put a specific name on them based on our per feeling, perception, intention, which arose due to contact and awareness. So I'm made up of the four great elements and you guys are all made up of the four great elements. But this set of four great elements is called Madhurujai uh, Your four great, of your four uh, great elements, that combination has different, different names. There's Vishaka, there's Chaturma, there's all those different names for those same four great elements. Does it make sense? So it's because there's a certain feeling, perception, intention involved with that four great elements that arose due to contact and awareness. So we call that special contact of form. Rupakai Adivachana Sampas. Everyone, does that make sense? If it doesn't make sense, I'll explain it again. Everyone clear on that? Okay, and then there's another uh, type of contact, which is called gross contact of name. Now here, gross doesn't mean disgusting. It means the opposite of subtle, like crude, crude contact of name. So gross uh, we say in single like gorosu, gross, gross contact of name. And we say, namakai patika sampasa in Pali. Now, let's say there's the word mouse here. Now, if I told this to someone, if I said the word mouse to someone who knows English, but has never ever seen a computer in their life, what would come to their head? The animal, right? So when he when he see when he's recollecting this, when he's recollecting a mouse, what is he recollecting there? He's recollecting the four great elements. Does that make sense? So you guys imagine a mouse and you think, okay, a mouse has these kinds of ears, it has a long snout, it has a little curvy tail. What is it you're recalling? You're recalling the four great elements. Does that make sense? So we say that when you recall, whatever it is you recall, whatever you're recalling, that you're recalling the four great elements, whether it's the computer mouse or is the animal mouse or whether it's someone you know, 
whatever it is you can recall, you can only recall the four grade elements or anything made up of the four grade elements. Is that clear? So we call that gross contact of name. Now, these two contacts, even though we're talking, I'm only explaining this, them separately, but you can never ever separate these two contacts. These two contacts are what is occurring at every moment. Why? Because even though we only talked about uh, the this part here, the name portion, when you recollect this, you're also recollecting the four grade elements. And then when you recollect a mouse uh, in your head, you're also recollecting the four grade elements. And there's a feeling, there's a perception, an intention associated with that due to contact and awareness. So no matter what you see in the world, like right now you're looking at me, what am I made up of? The four great elements. So right now, Namakaya Patiga Sampasa is occurring. And Rupakai Adivachana Sampasa is occurring. Why? As you listen to this, you're seeing the four great, you're recollecting the four great elements. And with that, there's an associated feeling, perception, intention that arose due to contact and awareness. So no matter what you do in your, your life, your entire world is made up of these two contacts. There's nothing else. Whatever we associate with, whatever it is we think that's special, it's just these two contacts. Let's take, let, let, imagine, let's say, take someone who you really, really love, either your child or your parents or your friend or a friend. That person isn't, is just the four great elements. And this contact occurs, it's a feeling a perception and tension that arose due to contact and awareness. There's nothing more special than that. That's all there is there. It's just those two contacts occurring in our life. Does that make sense? So that's that's what we associate with. That's what we say as the two, other, two contacts that occurred throughout our life. So you can, contact is explained in this way. Uh, for name and form. And then the contact is also explained in the sixth sense, in terms of the six senses. So the contact here is talking about the six senses. And there's also a contact, we can say, that occurs from name and form. And that the Supreme Buddha explains separately. So he explained contact in that way and explained contact in the sixth sense basis as well. So everyone clear on that? And then so the Supreme Buddha saw, then what's the reason that name and form arise? So what's the reason for name and form? And he saw that consciousness, because there's consciousness, name and form arises. And then uh, what did he say was consciousness? He said that uh, consciousness arises in the eyes in the ears, in the nose, in the tongue, in the body, and in the mind. And what does consciousness do? It specially knows. That means, we say in Singhala, Visheshing Danaganna. So it specially knows. What does it know? It knows forms. It knows sounds. It knows smells, tastes, tangibles. It knows that it's hot right now. It knows that it's cold right now. That's all from consciousness. A dead body doesn't do that. So consciousness has the nature of specially knowing. Visheshing Denagan. And these two, so consciousness and name and form, these two arise almost together. They're, inter they're dependent on each other. And we talked about this in a previous lesson uh, where imagine... Uh, Imagine a child, the birth cycle of a child. So first, the, uh, there has to be phys something physical there, right? There has to be something, the name and form has to be there. But will that embryo develop if there's no consciousness? Let's say there's an, em there's an embryo, but there's no consciousness. Consciousness doesn't come. Will that ever turn uh, into a fetus and become a baby? 
It won't ever have why consciousness has to be there. Let's say now there's a child, eight months old, and that child for some reason passes away. That means that form gets damaged. Let's say that child, uh, uh, the form gets damaged somehow. Then what happens to consciousness? It leaves. Consciousness can't stay there without name and form. So what does consciousness do? It, it can't stay there. It leaves. And then let's say there's the child is born, another child is born, and at a young age, let's say at one year old, that child for some reason gets sick and passes away. Will name and form continue developing? Will that body continue to grow up? No, what's the reason? Consciousness isn't there. So name and form is dependent on consciousness and consciousness is dependent on name and form. So for name and form to rise, consciousness has to be there. Make sense? So consciousness has to be there for name and form. And then the Bodhisattva asked himself, so if you guys have any questions up to now, you guys should ask, and then I can clarify it. Vishak, is everything clear? Okay. Now we say, the Bodhisattva asked himself, what's the reason then consciousness arises? And the Bodhisattva saw that the reason consciousness arises is something called formations or sanskar. Now, he saw that there's three types. There's body formations, kai sanskara. There's verbal formations, vachi sanskara. And then uh, mentality formations. This is, make sure you note that word because there's really no English word for this. We say chitta sanskara. There's no real translation for chitta in English. Why? Because everywhere it's mind. Mind here means mano. So it's not mano sanskara, it's chitta sanskara. Do you guys understand the difference? We say in singular, sita, sita nava, manasa. So sita and manasa is two things like chitta and then mano is two different words in uh, the discourses. But most of the time, they have very close, similar meaning. But here, the Supreme Buddha describes it as chitta sanskara, so mentality formations. So those are the three types of sanskara. Now, when we say body formations, that means the breath in and the breath out. So every single one of the three, body formations, verbal formations, and mentality has two things involved with it. So kai sanskara or body formation means uh, the breath in and the breath out. Verbal formations means uh, applied thought and sustained thought. That means before we speak, there's a thought process there. We think a thought and then we maintain that thought and then we speak. So applied thought and sustained thought. And then Chitta sanskar or mentality formations means feeling and perception. Now, when we're talking about dependent origination, we're talking about someone who's alive. A person has to be existing. We're talking about a person here. So that person has to be a breathing, speaking, uh, person with the, with the mind, right? With working senses. So in order for a consciousness to be there, these, these formations, these sanskaras have to be there. So the kai sanskara, vajji sanskara, and chitta sanskara have to be there in order for consciousness to stay there. Does that make sense? So this is how the Supreme Buddha taught it. That these formations are reasons why consciousness stays there. Why consciousness exists. And then in another, in that, in, in the same sang, in the same uh, sets of discourses, the Supreme Buddha explains sanskara in another way. And that is uh, meritorious formations, punya sanskara, 
demerit demerit formations so like a punya bisanskara and then neither merit nor demerit that means the kind of karma you collect from uh dhyanas from developing high meditative states now this is very very interesting so let's say someone here goes and gives a dana you guys go and make food and then you offer it to someone whether it's homeless whether it's monks whether anyone you give it you make food and then you offer it what did you collect Pusha, what did you collect merit swami okay, you collected merit so that is a formation okay now let's say aran sariputta goes and gives aran nogalana dana what does he collect what does he collect um Does he collect merit? When an arahant gives a dana, let's say he gives something to another arahant. Let's say arahant gives something, does something good. Does he collect merit? The answer is no. So the reason why we collect merit or demerit or any karma at all is because we still have craving. is because we have craving that that merit gives us a uh, a result that that merit gives us a result because we still have craving that demerit that uh, akusal that power gives us a result because we still have craving and arahant completely doesn't have these sanskar doesn't have meritorious formation doesn't have demerit um, formations and neither uh, merit nor demerit he doesn't have any karma that will lead him to another future birth and what's the reason for that the supreme of the sad there's a reason why formations also occur and that reason is ignorance so what's the reason uh, an arahant doesn't collect any merit demerit or any karma at all is because he doesn't have ignorance which means ignorance means us not knowing the four noble truths the four noble truths being there's something called suffering there's a cause the second noble truth is the cause of suffering the third noble truth is the cessation of suffering and then the final noble truth is the path to the cessation of suffering the noble eightfold path arya stangika marge so the reason arahants don't collect any merit is because they are, they don't have ignorance that is completely abandoned by them so they don't collect any merit demerit or anything like that does that make sense so the reason now this is this is the this is the part that that's like crazy it says if the reason why these form the reason why sanskar forms is due to ignorance correct and what are the sanskar there's kai sanskar avachi sanskar and chitta sanskar and what's under kai sanskar breathing in and breathing out right now as we're all breathing in and breathing out we're breathing in with ignorance we're breathing out with ignorance we have applied thought and sustained thought with ignorance we're feeling and perceiving with ignorance this very moment this exact second what's occurring within us dependent origination is occurring we're creating new karma that's going to that's we're creating new karma that will lead to another future birth that will lead to not, again suffering right now it's occurring at this very moment as you're looking at this it's occurring within us why because we're even breathing in and breathing out with ignorance so look what look at what a problem we're in and look how amazing the buddhist knowledge is here 
No one else saw this. No one else saw the reason why suffering is occurring. What he saw, the Supreme Buddha saw that there's something called ignorance, which is that beings don't know that there's something called suffering, the origin of suffering, the path and the cessation of suffering, or the path to the cessation of suffering. Because they have no awareness, they have no understanding of reality, they're completely under ignorance. They're completely veiled by it. That's why the Supreme Buddha teaches the Supreme Buddha was the first person to break the shell of ignorance. And then he taught that this is what's occurring. This is what he realized when he became fully enlightened. This is what he, this is what he, the knowledge that arose within him. He saw the beings are uh, taken in sansara, taken in birth and death with because of dependent origination that's occurring at this very moment within us. As we speak, as we breathe, as we think, all of these things are occurring. Do you guys understand that? So, no matter what we're doing, unless we realize that this is what's happening, unless we see that there's only cause and effect, that's why I wanted to teach this topic. Before we move on to like uh, actually meditating, we need to figure out the problem here. What's the problem? Why are we even bothering meditating? At this very moment, we're creating another birth for ourselves. If someone doesn't understand that, if someone doesn't realize that, if someone doesn't see the problem, then they have no motivation to practice the Dhamma. They have no motivation. But why? There's no reason. They're only uh, That person will only look for a benefit or some uh, some relief for this life. But they don't see that they're in a huge problem. We're in like this huge tangled mess, which is that we're in dependent origination is happening at this very moment. We're creating a birth for ourselves. We're creating suffering for ourselves. And really we have no way out except the Dhamma. Unless we learn the Dhamma and we practice it. And unless we realize this, unless we see dependent origination within ourselves, then we can't come out of this. We have to... Uh, see cause and effect. Now, it's very, very important to understand that uh, in some places, in some books, they explain uh, dependent origination by breaking dependent, like this cycle. They break this cycle into three parts, past, present, future. That is completely wrong. It's 100% wrong. Why? Because nowhere in a single discourse does it ever break this cycle into three parts saying, okay, this part is from the past. This part is for the present. This part is for the future. The Buddha never taught it like that. The Buddha teaches this though, that if in the past someone had ignorance, then that person, because of that ignorance, had formations. Because of formation, that person had consciousness. Because of consciousness, they had name and form. Because of name and form, they had the sixth sense basis. Because of the sixth sense basis, they had contact. Because of contact, they had feeling. Because of feeling, they had craving. Because of craving, they had clinging. Because of clinging, they had bhava. Because of bhava, they had birth. And again, they had suffering. In the future, if someone has ignorance, this same set of things will also arise. But same set. He doesn't split the, this, this set into three different portions. He says, in the past, if someone had ignorance, then he had suffering. In the future, if someone has ignorance, then he has suffering. In the present, if someone has ignorance, then they also have suffering. Does that make sense? So splitting this into three parts, that's only found in the commentaries, in different uh, books that were written much later. So... When we learn, when we read the Dhamma, it's very, very important. We know what's from the discourses and what's from the commentary and what's from people's opinions. And the Supreme Buddha teaches in one discourse, there might be some issues with the Vinaya. Let's say there is a problem amongst the Sangha with, about the Vinaya, which means the rules of conduct. Let's say some monk says, okay, this precept is, I think it's like this. And the other monk says, no, the actual precept is like that. And there's a conflict there. The Supreme Buddha says that conflict is very, very small. It's not a big deal. 
But if someone has an issue with dependent origination, if someone takes the wrong meaning of that, the wrong interpretation, then it's a huge problem. Why? Because this cycle, this is what the Supreme Buddha took four uncountable eons and 100,000 eons to realize. It was this cycle, which was, why are beings suffering? And he saw it was these reasons. Now, coming back to the top, the Supreme Buddha teaches, when someone completely eradicates ignorance, then their sanskar uh, ceases. This is the cause. This is the effect. Ignorance is the cause. Formations is the effect. So if ignorance isn't there, formations can't be. If formations cease, then consciousness ceases. Understand? So this is the cause. This is the effect. If consciousness ceases, then there's no way for name and form to be there. Cause and effect. If name and form cease, then the sixth sense basis can't be there. Cause and effect. If the sixth sense basis ceases, contact ceases. If contact ceases, then feeling ceases. If feeling ceases, then craving ceases. If craving ceases, then clinging ceases. If clinging ceases, then there's no karma to bear fruit. Bhava ceases. If there's no bhava, then there's no birth. If there's no birth, then there's no suffering. Cause and effect. Does that make sense? Everyone understand? So Supreme Buddha teaches, this is the only way. If someone eventually wants to see suffering, no matter what they do, no matter what kind of meditation they do, they're eventually going to have to see dependent origination. Or they're going to have to see the five factors of clinging. If someone sees the Dhamma, they see dependent origination. They see the five factors of clinging. If someone practices the Dhamma, they're practicing to eliminate dependent origination. To remove this from occurring within them. So this is something very, very important. Now, last week I told you guys to uh, practice, uh, practice seeing this once a day, right? Did you guys do that? You guys did that? Did you check out you did that? See, so there's no point learning this unless we actually practically use this. So now you guys know every single part. You guys know the meanings behind each part. And you can uh, you can investigate this within yourselves now. You can see this in your own life now. And how do we practice that? The easiest way is to start from suffering. Why? Because there's something that's very, very clearly visible for us all. And if there are parts that some of the terms maybe you've forgotten, then go back and relearn those parts and then be familiar with them. That way, when you recollect dependent origination, then you have a very, very good understanding of what's occurring. Why? Because our goal in our life is to see cause and effect. If we can see cause and effect, then we can see the Dhamma. We can see suffering. We can remove our craving for things. Why? Because we know this is just cause and effect. If someone wants to get rid of suffering, then they know there's a cause for it. What is the the reason? It's because of ignorance. If someone can get rid of ignorance, then they can get rid of suffering. And ignorance, the Supreme Buddha teaches, as uh, have you guys ever seen houses uh, with a circular roof? Have you seen houses like that? It's like structures with a circular roof. Now the circular roof has uh, at the center, all the rafters go to a pinnacle. There's a single part in that roof, which holds all the other rafters together. If someone removes the pinnacle, then all the rafters break apart. The whole roof collapses. In the same way the Supreme Buddha taught, that ignorance is like that pinnacle. All the other defilements, anger, lust, everything else, it will... All of that arises from ignorance. So if someone removes ignorance, then they're removing that top pinnacle and all the other defilements fall apart. So again, ignorance is at the very top. The main reason why, well, the reason why dependent origination is occurring right now. So 
again now i taught i think a few times how to recollect this now what's a good example of when we can recollect this like practically you can either sit down and do it as a meditation uh, or you can try doing this from like throughout your day like take an experience that you have in your day it could be from the past something that occurred in the past and then you can reflect on that so uh, shall we try that for a few minutes okay so everyone close your eyes and then try doing this reflection this week so close your eyes and now think of uh, some suffering, like a type of suffering you saw, which uh, really made you uh, be tired of life, be tired of, uh, ex uh, of being born in this world. It could be someone, a moment where you lost a loved one. It could be seeing an animal that was dying on the street. It could be seeing conflicts that are happening around the world. Think of all that. Think of those sufferings. It could be a personal experience. It could be a med it could be something that you're involved with. And think, what's the reason I'm suffering? What's the reason these other beings are suffering? And really ask yourself, what's the reason this is happening? And then understand the reason I'm suffering. The reason these other beings are suffering is because they were born. If none of us, if I wasn't born, if these other beings weren't born, then none of us would suffer. So then birth is the reason for suffering. But why were we why were, why were beings born? Why was I born? The reason is I had come to be born. I had come to be born as a human. These other beings had come to be born in those states. So the reason beings are born is because of Bhava. And what's the reason these beings had come to be born? It's because of clinging. They clung to views. They clung to sensual pleasures. They clung to rituals and practices and they clung to a notion of self because beings clung because of clinging bhava kama form to bear fruit and what's the reason beings cling it's because of craving it's because of craving for sensual pleasures it's because of craving uh, for existence is because of craving for non-existence that beings cling. What's the reason for craving? It's because of feeling. All types of feeling, pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral, all these feelings lead to craving. And what's the reason for feeling? The reason for feeling is contact. Wherever contact occurs, whether it's through the eye, whether it's through the ear, whether it's through the nose, whether it's through the tongue, through the body, or through the mind, all forms of contact lead to feeling. What's the reason contact occurred? The reason contact occurred is because of the six sense bases, because the eye was there, because the ear was there, because the nose was there, because the tongue was there, because the body was there, because this mind was there, contact occurred. What's the reason for contact? I and mean, what's the reason for this, these six sense, six sense spaces to be there? The reason is name and form. If name and form weren't there, then these six sense bases wouldn't arise. And what's the reason for name and form? It's because of consciousness because consciousness is there this name this name and form arose what's the reason for consciousness to be there is because of formations because formations were there because body formations 
because of verbal formations, because of mentality formations, consciousness arose. And what's the reason formations was there? It's because of ignorance. Because these be because I didn't know the four noble truths, because I don't because these beings don't know the four noble truths, I am under ignorance. Because I haven't realized suffering, because I haven't realized the origin of suffering, because I haven't realized the cessation of suffering, because I haven't realized the path to the cessation of suffering, that's the reason why this cycle is going on. And if one day I am able to get rid of ignorance, then formations will cease. If formations cease, then consciousness will cease. If consciousness ceases, then nama rupa, name and form, will cease. If name and form ceases, then the six sense bases will cease. If the six sense bases cease, then contact will cease. If contact ceases, then feeling will cease. If feeling ceases, then craving will cease. If craving ceases, then clinging will cease. If clinging ceases, then formation of kamma to bear fruit, bhava, will cease. If there's no bhava, then there will be no birth. Birth will cease. If the birth ceases, then suffering will cease. Then my goal, everyone's goal should be to get rid of ignorance. Okay, now you can slowly open your eyes. Now you can practice this kind of uh, thinking pattern. Uh, whenever you see, whenever you have an opportunity, there's something you can do in the car. There's something you can do going uh, on the bus. There's something you can do anywhere, at home. Whenever you're doing something, you can think in this way. That way you're training yourself to see cause and effect. Seeing cause and effect, it's okay if you don't see anything else. If you can see cause and effect, then that's something amazing. That's something very, very important. But that's what we're trying to see. Our goal is to see cause and effect. In single, we say, hey, tu paladham. If we can see that, then we can truly see, we can truly get rid of our attachment. We can see that this is something that arose due to a cause. All those happy feelings, all those sad feelings, all those uh, neutral feelings, they all arose due to a cause. Then we won't chase after those feelings, which we've been doing for our, every single birth. Every time we feel something pleasant, we chase after it. Every time we see, feel something unpleasant, we get conflicted with it. Every time we feel a neutral feeling, we fall into more ignorance. So the only way to get rid of that, only way to get rid of this cycle is to get rid of ignorance. It's to see that there's only cause and effect. If we get rid of the cause, then the effect will cease. If we get rid of ignorance, then suffering will cease. So that's, we covered every single part of dependent origination. Uh, all those previous videos are uh, on YouTube. You guys can watch them if there's a part that you missed. Uh, and you guys can now you have dependent origination, you have the fundamentals, and these fundamentals are very, very important when we're learning about uh, other kinds of meditations, when we're learning about uh, different discourses. This kind of this knowledge on dependent origination will help you understand all of those other discourses. Yes, in, when the Buddha taught the Dhamma, that in the Sangmita Nikaya, when he taught this, he put dependent origination second before any of the other discourses. And then he put the five factors of clinging. So there's a reason why he put it, because the other discourses further on, you need to have a general idea of dependent origination to understand those discourses. So there's an order to these things. So if there's any part uh, that was confusing, that maybe you need more clearing up, you guys can ask. Uh, and then next week, uh, it won't be a specific topic. It'll just be a question and answer session. So you guys can have questions, have some questions ready. 
and then you guys can ask for that for next week. Okay, and so does anyone have any questions on what we've covered so far? Chaturam, you understood everything? Vishak, I'm sure I understood all of it. I can't hear you. I think I understood, but I have to practice more. Okay, and like a good way to practice is get like a small calendar, print it out, or if you're used to, no, actually just print it out. Print it out and put it in a place where you can see it constantly. Like maybe on your door or somewhere uh, on a table that you always look at. And then you can check mark, put like a little check on the days you did some meditation, on the days you contemplated it. So, and then that way once after a while, let's say after a month, then you see your entire month is filled with you meditating at least once a day, even if it's one minute. That way you feel encouraged to do it again and again when you see those check marks. Uh, now can you unmute? Okay. After someone answer, um, we talk about the Bhava formation of Kamatubaya fruit. In yes. that, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, bad destination, Arupa Loka. Yes. Uh, I have a question because it's not clear for me. Uh, Swaminasa said that uh, the specific verse based on the specific meditation, those people are going to that world and it's not a good destination. So, yes. so the, explain that again. Okay, so we said, um, the question was, uh, we talked about the three types of bhava. So there's uh, birth, there's three bhavas. So take it as three realms there's three main places where someone can be born one is the sensuous world one is the form world and one is the formless world and we said when someone's born in the formless world it's not good why because no beings can realize the dhamma in the formless world in that world when someone is born there those beings are just like in a coma they're like asleep so uh, as someone who wants to realize the Dhamma, we shouldn't have a goal of going to there. Why? Because you're just kind of in a coma, right? So the reason beings are born in those worlds is because uh, when they meditate, after they pass the fourth jhana, there's something called formless jhanas. Okay? And one of them, for example, is uh, neither perception nor non-perception. So nevasanya and nyasanya. Bhavana. When they cling to that, when they have a craving for that feeling, when when they come to that meditative state, then beings are born based on that craving in those formless worlds. And then I think Vishaka asked me, uh, do anagamis go there? Did you ask me something like that? There's a so anagami people, anagami, someone with anagami state can go there. So, uh, to understand that, right now, we there's something called, have you ever heard of the 10 fetters? There's something called the 10 fetters. That means there's these 10 things that are a reason why we're born uh, amongst different worlds. Okay? So, there's the five lower fetters. And then there's the five higher fetters. Five lower fetters means if someone has those five lower fetters, then they can be born in any world. They can either be born, they can be born in hell all the way up to the formless worlds because they have all 10. Make sense? So the five lower fetters, if those are strong in someone, they pull them lower. They pull them down. Five, that, that means they're born in the sensuous world. They're born either in the Deva worlds up to hell. Okay? Sensuous world means from the Deva world all the way up to hell. Form means form worlds are the Brahma worlds. 
is, is that am I being confusing? So the what do the five lower fetters do? They bring someone to the sensuous world. And what does the higher fetters do? They bring someone to the higher worlds. They bring someone to the Brahma world or the formless worlds. Okay, and we have all ten within us. Now the five uh, lower fetters, uh, those are self, sakai, self view, uh, doubt, sakai uh, vijicha, wrong practices and rituals, clinging to those, uh, and then kamatan, uh, craving for sensual pleasures, and patiga, uh, ill will. Okay. So when someone comes to the first stage of enlightenment, what's the first stage of enlightenment? Sota pan, stream enter. That means what that person removes three of these fetters. Okay, there's 10 fetters. He removes three of them. He removes sakaiditi, self-view. He removes uh, uh, wrong clinging to wrong practices and views. And he removes vichikicha. He removes doubt. When he removes those three, that those three things are the reason someone is born in the four bad destinations. Okay, someone is born in the four bad destinations is because they have those three things. What are they? Self view, doubt, and clinging to wrong practices and views. So someone who who removes all those three. They can never be born in the four bad destinations. They can be born in hell. They can be born in the ghost world, in the asura world, or the animal world. That's why a sotapanna person, a stream enter, is freed from the four bad destinations. They don't have the reasons why. They don't have the cause to be born in the four bad destinations. Make sense? Then we come to the second stage of enlightenment which is sakadagami we say once returner that person has again removed those same three things self-view doubt and clinging to wrong practices and views and he's he's uh, lessened he's suppressed uh, craving for sensual pleasures and ill will so those from the five He's reduced the last two a lot. That's why he only comes back once to the sensuous worlds. He's only reborn once amongst the devas or humans. Does that make sense? Then the anagami person, that's the third stage of enlightenment. That we say non-returning. That person completely removes these five lower fetters. These five lower fetters lead again where? They lead you down. Deva world all the way up to hell. Anagami means you completely remove the cause to be born amongst devas and the four bad destinations and the human world. So that person, an anagami person, will never non-return. He does not come back to the lower world. He does not, he's not reborn as a deva, a human, or any of the four bad destinations. Make sense? Okay. So that means he can only go high. He can only go to the higher worlds. Either the form worlds or the formless worlds. So most of the time what happens in an Agami person ends up going to uh, special worlds in the form worlds, special Brahma worlds, which is just for people who've come to that stage of enlightenment. But then there are some times when an anagami person also reaches those high uh, reaches those high meditative states and they have a craving for it. So let's say there's an anagami person and they really like neither uh, that meditation, uh, neither perception or non-perception, okay? Then because he has that craving for it, he will be born again in the in that world of the formless worlds. He'll be born like as a being who's like in a coma. And then when his lifespan is over, he might come back. So he might be born again and again like that in the higher worlds, but he will never come back to the lower world. 
Okay? Because nowhere does it say an anagami person in the next life will become enlightened. It doesn't say that. Make sense? So a nagami person will either go to the form worlds or the formless worlds. But there are normal people without any stage of enlightenment who go to the formless worlds. For example, the Buddha's first two teachers, uh, one of them being Alar Kalam, I don't know if I'm saying that name right. He also meditated on the uh, formless dhyanas, those higher uh, meditated states. And he went to the formless world. Now, even right now, at this moment, he's still there. He's like in a state of coma. And even if the Buddha travels there, he can't teach in the Dhamma. He can't understand. He's in like a stage of sleep. Like he's like asleep. He, even if you talk to him, he can't understand. That's why we say being reborn in those places is bad. Why? Because you can't realize the Dhamma. Okay? Any other questions? About what we talked about. Uh, okay, then we didn't, and we'll share all the merits. So, for these past four weeks, we learned dependent origination. We discussed all these things. We collected lots of merit by contemplating dependent originations, by learning dependent origination, and listening to the Dhamma. All the merit we collected, we share with all the devas. May all the devas rejoice in this merit. May they provide righteous protection to all these lay devotees and their families. May all the devas also have the good fortune to escape from this long journey of sansara. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. We share this merit with uh, all uh, the departed relatives of all these lay devotees. May all those departed relatives rejoice in this merit. May they have a good life in the next world. May they also have the good fortune to escape from this long journey of sansara. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. We share all the merit we collected with our teacher, Pingwat Lokuswami Mahase, with all the monks of Mahamunava, all the monks training in the Buddha's dispensation. May all the monks rejoice in this merit and also learn, also realize the Four Noble Truths in this Gautam Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. We share this merit with all these lay devotees and their families. May all those, may all these lay devotees be happy, healthy, and well. May you all have the good fortune to realize the four noble truths in this Gautama Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Everyone chant with me. Kāyena vācha chittena pamadena mayakatang achayang kama me bhante bhuripanya tatagata Kāyena vācha chittena pamadena mayakatang achayang kama me dhamma sanditika kālika Kāyena vācha chittena pamadena mayakatang Achayankam me sang punya ketang anutter sadhu sadhu sadhu. I will chant a blessing for you all. Abhivadana silis nichang vada pachaino chataro dhamma vadanti ayuano sukambalang ayuraro gesampati sagasampati me vacher. Ato nibbana sampati yaminate samijatu. May you all be happy, healthy, and well. Teruan Saranai, Namo Buddhaya. Abhisa Samin once, may we ask forgiveness? Okay. Oka Savanda Mibante, Naya Katan Tunyan, Samina Anamoditabang. Sadhana Katan Punyan, Nai Hangata Bang, Sad 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 Sad